Hello, sea salt friends. My name is Lamorna Ash, and I am a writer, and I also work at an education charity called Int University. I've very kindly been invited to take part in Sea Salt's virtual book club by sharing an extract from my new book, Dark Salt Clear, which I have today, and in fact today is its publication date, so I'm very excited. Um, uh, while many of us are housebound at the moment, it's great to pick up a book. So if you love reading and also want to explore something that actually does look at loneliness and isolation, albeit on a trawler rather than in our homes, then maybe this book will provide some kind of solace for you. I know that for me, it's been the most extraordinary experience of writing it, so I do hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm actually wearing sea salt clothing right now, which I'm really pleased with. I love anything that is a jumpsuit, something I can move around in. I used to go to sea salt quite a lot with my mum when we used to go to Cornwall. Both my mum and my granny and my great-grandmother are all from Cornwall. And we would go to sea salt and pick up the most beautiful um, kind of dark-coloured jumpers and uh, striped shirts like fishermen. And I remember wearing them in London and it would be something that made me hold on to Cornwall, uh, having those pieces of clothing that came from Cornwall. So I'm a big fan of sea salt clothing. Um, Dark Salt Clear is set in a town called Newlyn in Cornwall. It's a non-fiction book and it's about my experience of living in this fishing town for a while, going out on boats, everything from deep sea trawlers for a week, to crabbing vessels, to ring nets who catch pilchards, to spending nights uh, in the auction houses trying to sell fish, um, basically being immersed in the village, in the town, in every way that I could possibly. Um... This particular passage that I'm going to read now is from a later stage of the book. It's after I've been on the trawler for five days, and the day before had been a particularly hard day. So this is about starting to feel that the boat is the only place in the world and coming to terms with that kind of isolation with these wonderful four fishermen that I was with on the boat. So I hope you enjoy. Dropped Things By Friday morning on the Philadelphia... My ties to home have begun to unloosen, and I let the boat be the only place in the world. From here on in, I learn not to count the days, not to think of my bed or my parents or my unbounded cross-coastal walks, or the reassuring sound of the surf coming into contact with the land. Instead, I start to think of our fishing boat as the centre of the universe, all life reduced to the single disk of sea surrounding us. I wake early and tear myself straight away out of my sleeping bag. My dreams have been coloured with yesterday's grey and I'm keen to meet this morning with as much energy as I can muster. It is still dark enough to make out the stars through the bathroom porthole. Each time I find myself out at sea overnight, my eyes are always drawn to a small, faint constellation low in the sky. The dim points of its stars draw out the two loops of an eight. But the lines do not quite cross over to finish the number, and the upper loop is slightly distended. Perhaps it is because of light pollution, but I don't think I've ever seen this lasso-shaped cluster of stars from the land. I begin to associate it with the sea, a guiding constellation for fishermen. Back home I scour endless star charts of the Northern Hemisphere on the internet, to find my fisherman's constellation, but none of them quite seem to resemble it. I head out to the wheelhouse balcony, where we were alone at sea for the first few days. There has joined us now the dotted lights of Cornish trawlers at every compass point along the horizon line, adding grammar to its otherwise uninterrupted perimeter. The wind is not as harsh as it usually is this morning. There is a touch of warmth, an almost balminess to its breath, I look up. The figure of eight and all other traces of stars have already fled the, in preparation for the unfurling of the day. A pink haze emanating from the east spreads out in both directions until it has stained the canopy of the sky. Then the lowest streaks of cloud begin to glow from below. The clouds grow hotter until they appear gilded all over like burnished metal. At last, from under the sea there comes a sliver of blazing light, and then the round ball of the sun appears in a way I have never seen before. It is not yellow or gold, but arrives in a bright lime green instant. A 
few days earlier, the crew had told me about the elusive green flash. They occur when sunlight separates out into different colours as it meets the atmosphere, working like a natural prism. As the sun slips into or out of the sea, the spectrum of colours that make up its light disappear or appear one at a time. At sunrise, green is the first colour to materialise. At sunset, it is the last. On a perfectly clear afternoon, the ideal conditions for a green flash, Kyle stood with the crew of the Joy of Ladrum, waiting in anticipation for the sun to turn green as it hit the horizon. But it never happened. The sun disappearing behind the world without so much as a glimmer of colour. After that, Kyle lost faith in the validity of the story, relegating the green flash to mythical status. Don says he has seen it just once in over 30 years of fishing. In that second, however, alone outside the wheelhouse, I witness the green flash. I raise my camera up to capture it, and in the second between my seeing the flash and placing the viewfinder up to my eye, the sun is its ordinary white-yellow. I continue to stare right at the sun until it gets too bright and I must look away. The dark spot it leaves on my retina sliding across my sightline like a fly. While en route to the Brazilian port of Santos in 1943, anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss reflected on the difficulties of producing the rising and setting of the sun as seen from a ship into adequate expression. If I could find a language in which to perpetuate those appearances, at once so unstable and so resistant to description, if it were granted to me to be able to communicate to others the phrases and sequences of a unique event, which would never occur in the same terms then, so it seemed to me, I should in one go have discovered the deepest secrets of my profession, he wrote. There are rarely words good enough to describe the very best things, as there are a few appropriate for the very worst. It is not impossible to It is not impossible to articulate a tragedy at sea, but our words miss something. Language can only ever be a metonym for the universe, evading our absolute description of it, as the sea evades absolute containment by man. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening. Dark Salt Clear is now available to buy from Waterstones Online and other local bookshops that are still functioning online as well. And it's also available in ebook and also in audio read by me. Sea Salt has also signed 10 copies to give away. So head over to their Facebook page to enter this competition now. Thank you so much and I hope you all keep safe in these strange times.